this session on ministry with Chinese international students attending high schools here in the United States. I'm very privileged to have three people here joining us. Father Jonathan Michigan, who is coming in via Zoom from Texas. Dr. Gary Megan, who teaches here in the San Francisco Bay Area. And Father John Chen, who is a pastor in the Boston area, but who has had extensive experience in education. I'm Father Jonathan Michigan. I am the chaplain. Uh, and as of just recently, the Interim Theology Department Chair at St. John the 23rd College Preparatory High School, um, which is uh, in Katy, Texas. So we're, we're just outside of Houston. Um, John the 23rd is, is an independent co-educational uh, Catholic high school. And so what that means is um, we're not a parochial school. We're not run by or connected to the archdiocese. We do have a, certainly have a good relationship with the archdiocese of Galveston, Houston, and we try to maintain the, the standards that they uh, give to us. Uh, but we are independent, which gives us uh, some uh, freedom and flexibility with um, how we uh, approach things, um, which as it turns out is part of how we were able to do some of what we've done with our, our international student program, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, the, this school has about 400 students um, and we have a very strong Catholic identity here, very strong emphasis on that. Um, every student is required to take four years of theology and uh, our, our curriculum uh, operates at a, at a pretty high level. Um, we use, uh, as a base, we use what's called the Didache curriculum, um, which I think comes out of Midwest somewhere, I'm not sure. But, um, but we, you know, we have our freshmen are, are learning St. Thomas Aquinas, you know, like we're, we're, we're really trying to give them a, a strong uh, focus in these things. Um, John the 23rd also, you know, we're not connected with uh, any particular religious order. So unlike a school that has uh, Dominicans or Jesuits or whoever, you know, we didn't start out with a particular spiritual charism. Um, and so we've had to kind of discover that for ourselves. And what we've what we've determined over the years, what we figured out, and the school is still relatively young. I mean, the, we, we started in 2004. Um, but what we've, what we've figured out is that our charism, our spiritual identity, if you like, is very much tied in with our patron saint, with Pope St. John the 23rd, and with the Second Vatican Council. Um, we base everything that we do off of these four pillars that, that connects in some way with the, the four constitutions of Vatican II. And we, we, we take a lot of uh, pride in that. Um, and so one of the things that that means for us is that we're very much concerned about our faith, not just being something that we put on a shelf or just do in a room somewhere, but that it's something that really is active in the world, right? That we're engaging uh, the world. Um, and that's part of the impetus that led to us deciding to have an international student program, despite being such a young school, still being a relatively small school. We felt like if we want to engage the world, what better way to do that than to have students from around the world come to our school um, uh, so that we can teach them, but also so that uh, we can learn from them. And so the program here began in 2016 with um, just a few students, uh, but it really gets rolling in its second year, which was 2017, 2018. Um, it quadrupled in size. And I, I, I can't remember exactly what the number was, but I think it's somewhere around 25 students at that point, which if you consider the size of, of our school is actually a, you know, a fairly decent um, percentage of the school population. Um, and we have students from, from here, there, and everywhere, but the, the large majority coming from, from Asian countries, um, 
from mostly from South Korea, from Vietnam, and especially the, the majority within that from China. So we had to figure out among other things, how are we gonna fit these international students into our um, theology classes, into our theology curriculum? And so the, that first year when we just had a handful of students, they just placed them in, in the regular theology class. Well, that turned out to be a little tough for them. Um, they kind of got lost in the mix. And so uh, the second year, that 2017, 2018 year, the determination was made, let's have a dedicated theology class just for our international students. Um, and we did that. The problem is we didn't really change what we were doing. We just put them all in one room. Uh, and then did the normal curriculum with them. Um, well, that helped us to keep better track of them, but it didn't actually meet their, their needs. Um, but what we did do as an accommodation at that point is we added a, 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 an extra uh, class just once a week for these kids uh, where they could, that was taught by our international student director um, uh, along with me, um, where they could get help on a variety of subjects, right? Where they could learn, you know, if they were having trouble with a particular class, uh, if they were having trouble with English idioms, you know, anything like that. Um, but often theology ended up being a part of that over and over again, because it was the thing that was the most confusing to them. Uh, they, they were having the most trouble kind of figuring out what they were supposed to be doing. Um, and so going into the 2018, 2019 school year, we decided, okay, we need to do this very differently. We need this dedicated class for international students to actually be tailored to them. Uh, and so we need a curriculum that makes sense for them and for, for their needs and their level of knowledge coming in. And, uh, and it fell to me to teach that class. And what I click, um, quickly discovered is that the kind of curriculum that I needed uh, did not exist, or at least I couldn't find it. So I was gonna need to invent it if I was gonna do it. Um, and so I went about starting to do that. And I'll talk in a minute here about exactly what ended up being in this curriculum. But I started with a lot of initial challenges that needed to be overcome. First of all, the question of who should be in the class. And uh, we determined that basically, um, unless you were coming from a, a, a country with a, a, a strong Catholic culture, so we have some students from like Venezuela and, um, well, I don't know that Venezuela has a strong Catholic culture at this point, but. Uh, Mexico, some, some other places that they, they seem to be okay where they were. But uh, the upshot of this was most of our students from Asian countries were going to end up being in this class, including uh, a lot of them who had taken the class the year before and gotten kind of lost. So I began the year with 19 students in this class in four different grade levels, uh, ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, okay, which meant they were all different ages, right? Because some of them, of course, they, they might be a 10th grader or 11th grader, but that, that might be because, you know, what they did in their home country didn't exactly translate over or something like that. So, so you know, age, age range from 14 to 20, basically. Um, and three different countries, right? Uh, China, Vietnam, and South Korea, all different levels of English proficiency. So I, I, had, I had kids who were totally fluent in English, who, but for a very slight accent, you'd never even know, know that they uh, weren't native speakers of English. And I had kids who were having trouble being understood when they strung two sentences together, all in the same room. Then 
there's the question of their different religious backgrounds, right? So I had, I actually did have two Catholic students who were from Vietnam, but everybody else was not Catholic. I had a, a couple of Presbyterian girls who were Korean. Um, and then I had Buddhists, I had Muslims, I had kids from a sort of animist background. Um, and then a, a fairly large number of kids from an atheist background or from basically no religious background particularly when we're talking about uh, the Chinese students, okay? Um, and the Chinese population in the class was certainly the largest. So out of 19, probably 10 of them were, were Chinese. I, I, I'd have to double check that, but you know, so, something like that, um, 10 or 12 maybe. Um, but then even within that population, there were differences because while the majority of those kids were, were Han, uh, I did have a few uh, Uyghur students and uh, discovered very quickly that, that these are kids who would never have interacted with each other if they had been in China. Um, and so that led to some interesting sorts of like cultural conversations as the year went on. So how do you meld all this together? How do you meet the needs of all these different kids, right? Because any of you who've ever taught, you know, you've got to figure out a way to hit everybody in the room. You've got to hit the strongest kid and you've got to hit the, the kid that's, that's weakest. you got, you know, the one that's really interested, the one that's not interested at all. Um, this was a lot of challenges to figure out how to overcome. Um, and... The biggest one being that for a lot of these students, they just didn't, you know, it's one thing for a, a kid, an American student to come into your class who maybe hasn't had any background in religion because of their family or they haven't had it in school or whatever before, but they still will have some base level of what they've absorbed from the culture, right? There are certain types of references that they will get. There are certain pieces of the story of Jesus and so forth that they'll get. Uh, but these kids really didn't have any of that stuff. Okay. And so what we determined was we need to give them the story. That's where we start from. So I really spent most of the year going through the gospels with them. Uh, going through the story of Jesus. We used the U.S. Catholic uh, Conference as a, as a sort of baseline, uh, but then it was really just about who is God? Well, just the concept of God was hard to get. Let's start with the most concrete thing we can, can get. Here's Jesus. Here's him talking to people. What does this mean? Here he is dying on the cross. What does that mean? What does it mean to rise uh, from the dead? Um, what goes into all of that? And, um, and I found by doing it that way that these students really kind of came alive with it. And um, especially, you know, we used a lot of, I used a lot of opportunities for them to get up, act things out. So sometimes if they didn't understand what they were reading, they could act it out, it made more sense. Um, we did things like um, when we talked about the resurrection of Jesus, um, I had them research and, and learn about and look at evidence uh, for and against a, a real physical resurrection of Jesus. And then we had a little uh, pretend trial, and I brought in people, uh, other uh, faculty members who, who decided to be like the jury for our trial, and just kind of assign the kids to argue one way or the other. Jesus did rise from the dead. He didn't rise from the dead. Um, and they, they were really astounded by that. Um, a lot of the, the things that really surprised them were, were just how willing I was um, to let them really think these things through, um, that the whole purpose was not just to kind of shove something down their throat, uh, but to have them explore and, and truly sort of come to understand uh, some of this stuff. I did want to show you just briefly a couple of pictures of these kids so I can at least prove to you. That. All right, so here's, here's some of the class right here. Uh, this is our international student director, uh, Susie Kramer. And um, this was actually that first year um, 
that that I was working with them, but a lot of these kids ended up in the class that, that I taught. Um, here's a, a shot of the board from, from one lesson, and you can kind of see how I was working on a lot of just helping them to understand the background, helping them to learn how to read the Bible. I told them I wanted them, you know, because Catholics, of course, are not exactly famous for uh, knowing the Bible inside and out. So I, <laughs> I told them I, I wanted them to, to know the Bible better than, than all of the American students, and they, they thought that was great. Um, this is our international student director again, Susie Kramer, with two, two of my students. Uh, Anne and, and Crystal. Crystal was Chinese, Anne is Korean, um, but uh, we have students living with host families and the two of them actually were living in the same host family together. And then um, finally, this is a picture of uh, graduation. One of our students, um, Kaiser, uh, great, great kid, great. Uh, and this is a kid who really started out having a lot of trouble understanding what was going on and what we were doing and, um, you know, and did not do well in theology his first couple of years uh, and ended up with a, with a B average um, in theology. Uh, so, you know, we, we really did see results from, from, from doing this. The, the grades definitely went up and the comprehension went up as well. There were still difficulties that, that we had to work through understanding what it was that, that was expected of them. Um, and some of these are things that we're still working through, especially post-coronavirus, because the number of students that we have now has shrunk pretty cons considerably. Um, and so the ability to do what I did at, with, with 19 kids in the room is a lot harder when you only have five or six kids in the program. We're trying to, to work some of those things out now uh, and to, to let it evolve uh, naturally. I can get more into the weeds of some of this stuff, but I, I figure I'll just leave it at that for the moment. My name is Gary Meegan. Look at that. So we're high school guys and like Father, Father Jonathan, we're so proud of our boys and we'll just throw up the pictures of them anytime we possibly can. Um, Father Jonathan is probably a little bit ahead of where we are in getting things ready for the boys. I just want to just show you what we've been doing. Um, so first off, uh, very exciting. So we're uh, an archdiocesan school from the Archdiocese of uh, San Francisco. About 850, 60 boys. We have like more boys this year. It seems with COVID, the Catholic schools have done a much better job or an easier job of getting the boys ready, getting them the AP scores they needed, the SAT scores they needed, that were getting uh, pretty much impacted in the Bay Area at least, and we're very proud of that. 840, all boys, all boys, about 50 years old. I've been there for about 19 years. Um, it, it, I've, I've traveled to, to China and Hong Kong and Vietnam uh, getting uh, on recruitment. And the next slide is gonna show you what parents really, really want. Well, the parents, they want safety, they want discipline. You see the sort of things that they want. They want the high achievements, strong academics. Our boys, when they finished, um, calculus BC, those of you that know how AP goes, uh, if they finish that by the end of the junior year, they can go to the junior college and take more advanced classes. Uh, the extracurriculars that we have, we have a lot of our uh, uh, boys, actually Chinese kids, um, involved in football, oddly enough, which is wonderful. And uh, we have great peer support. The one thing you're not noticing there, religions like you know Catholicism, Christianity, that's not there, right? Because that's not... Uh, they know the Catholic schools are great in all of these, right? They're not as worried, but what I, what I appreciate is they're not as worried about uh, the religious aspect of it. So that's, that's been really powerful for us. Theology is freshman year, and pretty normal, like introduction to scripture. We spent about six months doing that, which, we, uh, which for our American kids works out really well. They kind of understand, because they've heard those names. They, they've seen some bad movies on Moses, remember the old ones, Ten Commandments, and they, they kind of understand Jesus and all of that, all the things that, that uh, Father Jonathan just talked about that our Chinese kids don't know about. The morality and ethics, which is pretty normal. We have it a little earlier than some uh, dioceses because we're concerned by that time. They're actually dating and seeing people, so that's really important. Then Christology and church history, 
which brings us right into what used to be called vocations, but now it's men and relationships, which we feel is a little more powerful for the kids. So what does it mean to be a true man? And uh, what does it mean to, to love? How do we love? How do we love women? How do we love our family? And that's, that's crucial. And then finally, social justice. How does a true man deal with a, a broken world? So these are what's really important to parents, and the Chinese parents love it. They're all UC approved uh, for the uh, for um, admittance to the UC system in, in California. And many of our boys go to UC, go to UCLA, go to Cal, um, go to UC Davis. Now, what we found though with all of this is we're like, oh wait a second, the boys are doing okay. They're doing a lot of memorizing, but when they go on retreats, which they love to go on, even our four-day silent Kairos retreat. They're not quite, most of them are not quite getting into it and like kind of understanding what's going on. And we're like, okay, so last winter, uh, I gave, and, and you can move on, I gave, I gave, this, um, I, I, I gave this form to all of our, our Chinese kids. And I can share this with you anytime. It's really simple. Just really simple questions. And I'm going to share the, what the presentation is going to be. I'm going to share what we found from the boys. So first off, is, the question was, when you came to the U.S., what did you know about theology or the Christian religion, right? So this was crazy. There we go. Defi uh, what they told us, they had definitions of God uh, and uh, a few of the well-known stories, okay? They kind of know maybe a little bit, maybe there's kind of like beginning of the world kind of stuff. But what this tells us is they're coming in with extremely minimal, right? I mean, this is, I, I know the... The, the staff was like, oh my gosh, I never knew that. And we're like, well, it's so obvious, right? So obvious. So once we found this out, uh, this, is, this is the first finding, and I just told the whole theology staff, and they're like, oh my goodness, okay. Things need to be changing really quickly. Now I noticed here, like, what were you nervous about when you first took theology? Just look at that. Having zero knowledge scared them. They came into math knowing, right? They came into history knowing a little bit. But they were worried we had never thought about this, saying something offensive. Uh, you know, or if we said this about God, would you be offended? As a teacher, did not want to offend us, which was pretty scary for us, right? Like the teachers, right? Being an American teachers, we never want to offend. Uh, and not being able to understand the concept of religion, just religion itself. And, and then finally, un unsure if they could keep up because they've never done it before. I would be extremely scared if I had no idea how to do this, right? If I went to China, as if our American kids went to China, I had to deal with it. I teach in, in the summers in Vietnam, and I know it's a lot the same. It's a lot the same in schools. So it told us they really felt ill-prepared in that background now. It's like, uh, even our kids who come in who are atheists, they're like, okay, I kind of get this whole thing, I can deal with it. And the lack of the background added tremendous stress, stress to them. So we're finding that they were studying even more and more and more for simple things, for simple uh, the true and false questions, just to make sure all of those were right. And they were worried about if they were wrote in any reflection to us, like that they would be offended. What was your attitude toward theology when you first took it? And why did you feel this way? Well, the juniors and seniors were very much into this whole thing. The freshmen were like, uh, oh, I only had a couple of days, right? But here, they thought right away, of course, it'd be useless. I'm not going to use this, right? And this is where Dr. Yan's uh, book, he says, the Chinese idea of imminence is, 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 is understood, but the idea of transcendence is not, right? The idea of transcendence is not a thing, right? So more Confucian understand, where do I fit, where things go? And that, that, that I thought was interesting. And they got very defensive because they thought religion would, uh, would, would be very harsh on them, right? So the first time that the priest, that Father Dave would come in, they'd be all nice and nervous and like, what do I do and everything like that. And, and so the idea of putting people in this. So it tells us they were worried that it was not only a waste of time academically, but they were worried that it would be judged for their non-belief. And that, that was pretty scary for us, all of these, as you can understand. What would have helped you to do better in your first theology class? Okay, here's, here's a little bit better for us. So um, finding a teacher to talk with us about the background of theology, what in the world are you talking about? Like, what is it? You come in the first day and like, okay, you're supposed to write down all this sort of stuff and everybody's saying, what religion are you? Okay, great, we'll talk about that. And they had no idea. They just needed a brief introduction and explain the relationship of the, uh, the characters 
is what they call the people in the Bible, the characters, which I thought was great. Um, they would wanted us to start with some world religions. One of the boys, wow, can we just start with world religion, see where everything fits? And I thought, whoa, right? That's an interesting thought um, because we take we do world history and then we see then we do U.S. history. All right, so there's some things and the previewing of the lessons online. Now we won't have that, but that's the sort of thing that uh, I'll show you. I'll tell you we're going to be dealing with that. So they wanted the grounding in the stories and they lacked the common knowledge about religion. What have you struggled with the most? Oh my goodness, right? Look at this. Projects, working with other students, what, and the writing. The projects is going to be huge. So we're going to talk with all the teachers because we all do projects everywhere. And it's not something they're, they're used to. So right away, we're going to need to do something about that. Group discussions, because they're not familiar. They, so when we get into small groups, they, they would just sit there and freeze. They're not used to doing small groups. And of course, whatever the teacher wanted, what, what you had to say, right? Well, like, well, wait a second. No, we're not the expert on your beliefs. We're not the expert on who you are. On the struggle with junior year, it gets very, very difficult. It's very academic, right? With history, with Christology, that, that's a little bottleneck. And uh, knowing the Bible stories, memorizing the storyline of the Bible, that comes back in. Are you starting to see what's happening all through? There's this through line. So they're not equipped for the group work, and they need scaffolding, more scaffolding for junior year, and better grounding in the stories. Now, six, what, what's, what, what is, this is great. What's your attitude? I need to be patient and work hard. Me, it's my, it's my problem. You know, it's like, no, come on, you're a young man. You can't deal with all of that. Studying philosophy in class helped me understand theology better. We are, we are putting uh, philosophy into each um, each of the four years to prepare for the theology. In fact, we look at science, philosophy, and theology, how they interact first thing before we do creation story. Right? So all the way through, in fact, uh, this year we're introducing when and who, and because that seems to be a real problem because they don't realize the importance is Ren, right? What is humanity? Which it brings us into Christianity. Um, so they consider uh, theology class um, as something to improve them mentally and related to everything in life. They learned a lot about Christian history. So see how things change. But at the beginning, we don't want that. So they generally feel good, but philosophy helps. And seven, if you're presently in China, what are the difficulties? Well, I thought that was actually just to leave that up there. Um, we had kids getting up at midnight and uh, getting done with school at six in the morning, and they were fine with it because it means so much to them to be with the class and with, with uh, everybody. And that was powerful for us. I thought that was great. But they wanted um, more flipped classroom. Uh, those of you doing education, um, I can talk to you more about that. That's pretty cool. Um, and number eight, do you feel you can easily talk with the teachers, right? What might help? Yeah, look, well, that's how they solved the problems. They would come to, uh, to office hours when they had it, except sometimes the office hours would be when they would be sleeping at 11 in the morning. So that was kind of hard. And uh, so they're pretty comfortable with us, and we really appreciated that. Now on number nine, what advice? Just look at this, if you could go to number nine. They want a brief introduction to today's chapter, short explanation of the characters. We need to do something about that. A familiarity of Western culture. Oh my goodness, right? Not enough of a familiarity. Are, are you seeing what teachers are going to have to do? It's going to be crazy. Um, connecting the subjects with the major subjects of religion with other subjects, which we thought was powerful. And let the, uh, combine an Eastern and Western culture to show how our theology relates to theology in China. That's why being here is so important for me and for our faculty. Right? It's going to be huge. And then most Chinese um, in, my, in my age are atheists and affected by the teaching of Marxism. This is a direct quote. I would feel more comfortable to take theology as a social science class or history class instead of the philosophy because it has certain difficulties to accept a worldview with God in it. Right? So the, the, this honesty from them. So here's our five takeaways. We need better introduction of what theology is, and what theology is. Christianity and Catholicism. They need to know their Bible stories, and they need to understand group work, because the only way we come to who we are as Christians and Catholics is by relationship, by talking, by understand, talking with each other. 
And so we need to make those connections to help them make sense of our theological worldview. Well, what we so the last thing here today, here on the last slide, uh, possible next steps for our department. So we're meeting um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday this week, and seeing where we can start to do this this year, how we can make this happen. Already this past Friday, uh, Mr. Taylor, who teaches mostly freshmen, and myself. We spent time uh, with our, our new students, hanging out, talking to them all about that, and what God is, uh, what theology is. And we also were gonna, gonna hang out with them on Monday, have lunch with them, just so that they can know their teachers before they go in, before they start classes, so we can spend time with them. So we're going to look at what we need to do, and we're gonna look backwards and see how we can, we can make our curriculum fit. Yeah, these are the boys, you know, again, Anytime we can show the boys, we feel really good. Father Jonathan, I like seeing your kids. That was the best. Thank you very much. Upon listening to Dr. Gary and Father Jonathan, I feel much at ease because the work I'm doing is only a preliminary, uh, helping the high school, helping students to come to this country uh, to study. The reason that I'm trying to do this is really... Uh, because of the current political situation in China. Um, I left China 80 years ago to come back to this country to be a parish priest uh, for many, many reasons. But over those years, I tried to turn the page of my life in China, basically to focus on my life here as a priest. But Father Michael approached me just suddenly and talked to me about high school, students and also the campus ministry, all those things. And it's, you know, awakening my conscience. And I said, you know, I got to get up and do something. And just uh, happy to be here to share with you what I'm doing. But what you have told me right now, all of us, it really put me at a very easy uh, situation. I'll tell you my concerns at this point. In China, the last couple of years, because our president Xi Jinping uh, is doing something, taking down the crosses from the churches because they are not in line with the Chinese structures, uh, not a very Chinese, and then they are everywhere trying to put uh, his picture in churches on the walls instead of the picture of Jesus or the crucifix. Uh, thank God our Catholic churches have not done that. And I have noticed many other uh, brother Protestant churches putting pictures on their walls. And uh, also many, many provinces, including Shandong, the worst one would be in Hernan province, they do not allow anyone under 18 years old to come to church services. Under 18 is not allowed because they are not there yet as a, a, a citizen mm -hmm. uh, or required voting age citizen. If they're too young to learn the Catholic faith, uh, therefore, no. And worse to that is that these students, many places, have to sign with their schools. Since in school, they should not practice the Catholic faith, even to tell others. We are Catholics. So being Catholics in China becomes a dangerous day. And upon knowing all those things, I said to myself, the youth in China is really in a very difficult situation. And the church is in a terrible situation. Because by going on this, uh, for this to be there for too long, the church probably will have no young people, and the forming years are gone. That would take a long time to form them, to introduce uh, them to the Catholic faith. Then I said to myself and talked with some friends, I said, are there some ways we can help? Because coming to this country, I've learned a lot, and this country is very good, very free. I talked to the uh, high school in Brighton, used to be uh, Sisters St. Joseph's uh, uh, 
high school. Now it's an a, a independent school. It's a Catholic one. And I talked to the principal, uh, and he said there, there are Chinese students to come uh, to study there. So I find ways they ask people in China if they would help. So uh, a friend of mine was running something, organization, to help students to go to Europe to study uh, masters and doctorates. Then I said, do you do something like for the high school students? So they talked about it, they said, sure. Now they're trying to help this program. So I talked to this high school, then talked to another school in Waltham, from grade uh, K1 to uh, eighth grade, and um, then another school in Morden, like that. So they're waiting to accept the students. So my work now is ready to, to get the students here. Now I know you too, mm -hmm. and Father Michael wants to take this into the, uh, under the, uh, the administration. Would it be a great thing? Because there are great opportunity there to help the youth and to study from your schools to uh, respective schools that you have, you have done a lot is to educate these students. Now I'm more encouraged to let my friend know in China you know, to, to do more because she has already uh, established a team to reach out to many, many dioceses to find Catholics, many had Catholics to come to this country. And there are certainly problems, uh, difficulties and challenges at this point. And uh, the tuition is very high here. And uh, their English prophes prophes uh, prophecy uh, is, is also not up there yet. So they are trying to do that. And the other things, visa applications, I try to uh, work with the, uh, the consulates uh, to help them to get a visas. And but knowing your experiences upon learning what you have to be, been doing, I think we can work together. My father Michael is certainly he, being a key person. We can do a lot to help the people, the young ones. And um, so let them know they are they will be fine. They will be okay in this country because we are the people to, to help them in any way possible. So thank you very much. And pray for me, pray for us, that we do the best. Uh, I'm Maggie Lau from Los Angeles. And uh, currently, I'm, uh, I'm working in, at the uh, Children Hospital. But uh, also, I'm serving in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles in the Office of Ethic Ministry as a president, current president. So uh, I, I'd like to just share my... Um, my experience, because I've been helping the archdiocese, you know, uh, in a uh, religious conference, congress every year, and we we did have the exhibition, you know, from different ethnic groups. But uh, the past ten years, I would say, uh, I came across with some teachers from high schools, Catholic high schools. And they um, start asking me and telling me, wait, Maggie, you know, we, uh, lately we have a lot of uh, foreign students coming from China, and we don't know what to do. Of course, though, um, maybe none of them are Catholics. So they share this with me, and then I share my, you know, idea with them. But on my personal, you know, opinion, I think, you know, this will be a very good opportunity for us living in Los in United States to reach out to all these foreign students, you know, no matter whether they're coming from China, from whatever province, or either from Hong Kong, um, doesn't matter if they're Catholic or non-Catholic, but we just need to get support and reach out to them and make friends with them. This is the way to plant seeds, to plant seeds on them. We don't want to force them to become a Catholic, you know, in one or two years. No, no, just make friends, make friends with them. And then eventually, 
either, either you know, after they graduate, they went back to their own country, they will think about the past. They will think about all the friends they made, you know, in the United States, and all the experience, and all the experience that they're learning, you know, from a Catholic school. So eventually, they will go to church, and they will bring their new family to church, and they bring their children to church. So this is one way of planting the seed. We, we don't want to force them. But then the teachers, you know, of course, you know, they have to face, you know, oh my God, you know, how am, I good, how am I going to do with all these foreign students that they have very limited, you know, English. But I tell them, don't worry, they will learn fast. But in order to make friends with them, we probably can um, have a dialogue or have a gathering, you know, for them to let them mingle with the Chinese who are living in here locally and share our experience with them rather than uh, look at them as a foreigner, you know. No, we are all Chinese. So it just, you know, happened you are from that country and I was from Hong Kong. But we are all Chinese, we are all yellow face, you know. So we are learning the same, the same. So, so this is the message that I, I just want to bring out that we look at them, don't go search, you know, who's the Catholic, who's the Catholic, no. We should teach them, we should, you know, welcome them, either they're Catholic or non-Catholic. Mm -hmm. And especially these, uh, you know, the, the foreign students at that age, the teenage, most likely their parents are still in China, mm -hmm. okay, struggling, you know, working. And they're just like, uh, oh my God, you know, I'm lost, I'm lost in here. But once we step in, we make friends with them, they probably just have a warm feeling that, oh wow, I have a second relative here. Maggie, I, I have to say, I think that you're right on target, the first step the most authentic step is, is, is just to reach out a hand of friendship. I have a question myself. You've met with uh, Chinese students in, at the high school level? Yeah. All right. Uh, could you give us an example of what are some of the questions that they would ask? I think this is a little concrete for us. <laughs> well, two high school students, uh, basically they were my friends' children, two friends. They went to Catholic school. Uh, one went to Catholic school, the other one went to a uh, public school. The one from Catholic school uh, in Boston uh, didn't learn the faith. And she studied theology well, but somehow uh, the effort or, or, or other things the school put into was not attractive to her. And I asked her, I said, you know, in a Catholic school, you should feel that you are most welcomed and learning something new about the faith is always good. And I said to her, your parents are Catholics and why not you, know, you just do that? She said, well, I just didn't like it. And that's it. Typical teenager. The other one, a public school, and her, uh, his parents, uh, father Catholic and mother not Catholic, and he's very interested, not baptized yet, and he went to Boston College, and he's doing very well, very sociable, and doing great things. So it's mixed, but they love being students here in this country. Mm -hmm. Well, it is interesting, too, that, that one student who, uh, again, maybe they, maybe they assume just because the student is Catholic, they don't have to open things up, they could just move forward and teach the, the doctrines and so forth. But that didn't grab the student. No, no. I think only teaching uh, academic way is not that attractive at all. And uh, the human formation is more important. Like uh, Dr. Gary said, you know, put, put a really efforts and meet them at their level and help them to grow would be the best. We have a question from Carolyn Noon. To all panelists, is there any record of how many high school converts from China who embraced the Catholic faith? 
I don't. No, I, I, I don't believe there is, and I don't know who would keep that record of it because um, I'm not sure which parish they would be a part of to keep those records. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm not sure. You'd have to check with the USCCB on that, I would imagine. Well, the, the question came from somebody who works with the USCCB. Or check with... <laughs> <laughs> this is a great question. And I'm, I'm wondering if uh, NCEA might have some information um, or the campus ministry people might have some information. Well, let me, let me ask, let's, let's bring this down to earth or down to, let us bring it back home. Well, so you work closely with a lot of students uh, from China that have gone to Sarah. Um, do you know of any who got baptized while they were there at Sarah? Yes, we did have one boy. We did have one boy with his, with his parents' consent. Yes, who was baptized? Okay. I'm not sure. It was a few years, a few years ago, probably seven or eight, seven or eight years ago. But so it's not overwhelming numbers, no. um, and I, at the same time, though, I have spoken with students from Sarah, from China, um, who rave about the education they got there and how welcome they were and how engaging the theology was. Um, but I, but I think. It was said earlier, sometimes you have to plant a seed. Um, and people in their own time decide, what does that mean? And do I become a Catholic, or do I open myself to the values of, of the faith? But we don't sort of have a lockstep program for that. No, and we also don't know uh, how many might have um, been baptized in college or later on. And uh, we at our school, we look at, at, at it as just kind of even getting the soil ready. You know, sometimes they're just kind of putting the fertilizer down um, before the seeds go in because, again, they have no idea. They have no idea. Oh, I have a question for you. Sorry. How well, many Chinese students do you have in the school? We, we cap at 30. We don't allow any more than 30. Uh, for our school, that works well because for homestay, uh, like Father Jonathan knows, it's not easy. You know, you got to be sure they're the right family. So 30 works well for us. Now, uh, Father John, uh, if I understand you correctly, your role is mostly recruiting students from China. Yes. Is that so? Yes. Now, are you still able to go back to China? Is China still open to you? After pandemic, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's open. So you're recruiting basically on the basis of people you've met in China before you came here, before before China got closed. I don't do that, uh, uh, you know, personally. Uh, the the friend of mine at home, mm -hmm. who is a very good Catholic, so she and her crew are doing that. Mm -hmm. So they are like professional recruiters. Yeah. So they're professional, and there's a, there was a network out there, and there's a whole system for recruiting and processing applications and providing support for that. So they have a professional network for that. Yeah. I, I just see another reason why we may not have that many uh, young students, you know, being baptized in here. They may learn the Bible, they may learn, you know, our, our, our religion, but somehow, you know, they still thinking in a way they still have to go back to China. You know, once they get back to China and then the government don't want you to be a Catholic. How am I going to face my parents? How am I going to work in the society with all these people? You know, so we, we, I think it's not a good way to force them to do anything, but it's up to them. And they're too young to in, in make the future, that. In the future, maybe, you know, if they want to stay here, that will be a different story, a whole different story, right? But then, uh, if they just come to the high school and maybe, you know, they can finish their college and once they need to go back, they say, wow, now I'm a Catholic. Excuse me. <laughs> yes, and, and, and so I, so, so I, I guess, you know, some, some kids, they may not, you know, have that comfort, you know, with them. Oh, my goodness, though, should I become a, a Catholic? You know, because I, I still need to go back to my country. Will that, will that affect, you know? Well, yeah, yeah, I would dare say, right, and just, they're under 18 and without parents' yeah. permission to do those things. And I, if I was a Chinese parent and my kid was there and I was worried if they came back home, what would happen? 
I'd say, why don't we wait? See? Why don't we wait? <laughs> yeah, yeah, baptism is not the main thing we want to have. We but want to educate them and let them know about our faith. faith. And that's it. We sow the seed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Kim, John, you're saying that uh, they can't go to church until they're 18. Mm. Okay. Can they receive religious instruction before that at home or in the church? Is that is the going to church mean going to mass on Sunday, or does it mean going to any kind of instruction in the church? The church is the church, in the beauty. You're so not allowed, not allowed to... to go to, to either instruction or mass in church until they're eighteen. That's from Xi Jinping, the president. Yes, mm -hmm. and the government. But, you know, Catholics always have ways to do it. <laughs> with, with, with that policy, with that policy, I can see uh, it's kind of like similar to the one-child policy. There is a big gap. One-child policy, they have a big gap, right? If they don't allow kids, you know, to go to church, you know, under 18, we can see, you know, in there's a big gap, you know, in between. Right. We uh, cannot. Do we have to. Are we going to have a young generation, you know, start coming in when? We cannot control that part, right? We, but we can control our behaviors. As Catholics, we know educating our children would be the best. So right now, many people went underground again. So they do what they have to do to keep the faith. Mm -hmm. So you have your way, we have our way. <laughs> so the faith can never be destroyed. I have a comment. Well, I came from China, not as a high school student, but as a, as a graduate student when I came. From my experience, I think the best way um, for me to learn is always learn by observing others. Uh, so as a non-believer coming to this country, by observing other believers' behaviors and actions and what they do really taught me a lot. And I think from the other standpoint, if you are a believer, you want to show the back example of your own behavior, I think that's the best way to attract them. If any high schools, um, Catholic high school, who want to show their welcome to the Chinese students who come into this country, I think the best way is actually to talk, to have a special talk with all the current American Catholic or American students. If you want to be a good Catholic, you need to show you are extra good Catholic to your Chinese new friends who just arrived, who knows nothing about Catholicism. I think that's the best way to attract them. You don't have to tell them, you uh, t explain to them, oh, what does Catholic mean? No, just be the best of yourself, and that's the best service you do for your own faith. Father Seif, I wanted to... Uh... Yes, I had a couple of questions that both both say, I think, the one-child policy. What happens if a couple breaks that if they have two? <laughs> and what happens if someone under 18 goes to church? This is kind of the same question. Yeah, yeah. Or, very briefly, uh, one child policy now is gone. Yeah. Now they well, encourage <laughs> to have two or three you know, more. Three. So it's all changed. Okay. Uh, what's not right is still not right at this point. But the second one is about who the one who goes to church, right? Uh, under 18, there are some, uh, some consequences. First one thing is the pastor might be in trouble. Uh -huh. So they do not go to the person, but they go to the pastor. Mm -hmm. The pastor is in trouble saying, why you allow that one to come to church? You're no good. Okay? What would they likely do to that pastor? Uh, a lot of things. Oh, a lot of things. <laughs> uh, we like can what? talk later. Either you can re be removed, or you can be oh, uh, the church. Yeah, sanctioned by a few things. They have always. And the other thing is that uh, this person who goes to church, you might not be able to go back to school. And the school might expel you for certain things. So because the public education is enforced by the government, we do not obey the rules, you might face the danger. So in one province, all the elementary schools, they have to sign a, sign a, like a, 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 what's that, promise with the school. I'm not a Catholic, I don't go to church. 
Wow. Yeah. So with that, they can do anything they wow. want to. That's stunning. That's why I want to help them. It, it seems like you know uh, what what you are uh, uh, explaining right now. You know, is, is there a little conflict with uh, Professor Yang? Because he he's been promoting, you know, look, China, you know, all these young, young, uh, you know, uh, teenage, you know, they all come out and they serve and then they they practice. And then wait a minute, wow, are, are they that open, you know, to do it? Well, his time basically from that picture started by 2018, okay? And the synthesization is later, very enforced the last two years, uh, three years. So it would it be a big different change. era? A big yeah, different era. Yeah. But that time it was. I helped a lot of students to come to visit my seminary. My comment is um, a few paces behind where, where you all are in the conversation now. But I, I was just saying that, um, you know, I, I tried to, you know, one of the things I, I tried to do with, uh, with my class was to incorporate as much as I could of the experience of Catholicism from each country represented in the room, um, in, including China, and to talk about, you know, both sort of historically what that looked like. Um, so we would do things like, for instance, you know, when I... I Kind of talked about Mary, and we would talk about um, Mary and figures. So we talked about Our Lady of China, um, but uh, but also um, you know in the the kind of things that that uh, Father uh, John was talking about um, the the experience there on the ground and the sort of uh, good, bad, and and otherwise uh, of what's happening there, and um, you know, and I found that the students were just they were just very surprised um, at, at all of it, right? Like, I mean, they one of the things that they found most surprising was when I would tell them that the largest number of Catholics in Asia were in China. And of course, they found that very surprising because none of them had ever met one, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but just that sort of, um, you know, completely not knowing what was happening there and then, you know, with, with some of the things that you mentioned about um, replacing crosses with pictures of the president and so forth, um, which um, the Han kids found very surprising and the Uyghur kids did not find surprising at all. Two takeaways for me that I think are very important. One is, uh, I think uh, Chen Xin had mentioned, well, example is important. Um, or maybe I even broaden that out to peer ministry. You know, you could sit as a teacher in a classroom and make it a lesson, but it's it's a living thing when peers share what it what it really means to them to be a Catholic, and we're not always very good at that as Catholics. We we occur well. We have come from a tradition where Catholics tend to be passive because the priest or the sister or the authority figure does the talking and, and people do the receiving. Um, I think there. Uh, our Protestant colleagues are way out in front of us. So young Protestant uh, teenagers are encouraged to, to share their faith with others. And that means, and what that does is that, that t makes them take ownership of their faith. It's not just uh, answers on a, on a quiz. It's, well, I have to own this and I'm going to share it with somebody else. Mm -hmm. So the that evangelical moment is also a, a moment of, of self-reflection. Um, and again, that can be an encounter in friendship and dialogue. It doesn't mean that you, you're, you're sicking one group of kids on another to, you know, sick to the other is, uh, you know, this mention of history. Um, you know, I think that, uh, in fact, few Chinese know that Catholicism has a very rich 400-year history in China that uh, figures like uh, uh, Lu Zhengxiang and, um, uh, and Xu Guangxi uh, were, were Catholic. You know? So these are, uh, Xu Guangxi was a you know, prime minister under the, the last uh, uh, Chinese emperor uh, of the Ming Dynasty. Um, very prominent s scholar and a figure in history. Um, many people have heard his name, but, but nobody very few knew that he was Catholic or knew about the story of his friendship with Matteo Ricci and so forth. 
there is a history there that um, is a little bit surprising for some people and kind of eye-opening. It makes them realize, oh, there is actually there's something been going on here. I would suggest, you know, uh, I, I don't know what you, whether you know about, you know, in California, we do have a very active, you know, uh, young adults, Chinese young adult activity. They call it the CACCLC. It's a California Chinese Catholic living camp. And they do it every year, you know, uh, on the Labor Day weekend. Labor Day weekend. And my both, my two sons, they are very active, you know, in that organization. And they, they did everything, you know, on the, by the youth. We don't have to do anything. So maybe if you have a chance, you know, um, just contact them. I, I can give you all the information. Contact Thank you. them, and they can share. You know, they live out their faith. In here, yeah. and they bring all the, the uh, foreign, you know, students. They invite them, you know, to join that living camp too. Can I throw out a, a sort of really off the wall sort of resource? Yes. Just because our conversation about history and stuff made me think of this. One of the things that I find, um, not even just with with uh, Chinese students or international students, but with with working with teenagers in general, uh, that that tends to be a, a good way of. Um, connecting in with them is, is when, when we have some sort of common ground, not something that's manufactured, but just something that ends up being common, right? So like, you know, my, my Chinese kids found out that I liked rap music. I used to be a rapper in another life. I'm sure you all assumed that as soon as you saw me. Um, <laughs> but uh, so like, so they started recommending like Chinese rappers to me, you know? So like there was that kind of stuff. Um, but one of the other things that um, I, I really love and I found a lot of the students really love is, is comics. Um, and um, there's a, a comic book writer, uh, a Chinese American comic book writer who I think lives in the Bay Area named um, Jean, Jean Luen Yang. I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right. Um, but he's, he is uh, Catholic. He's written for like the big kind of, you know, superhero books, Superman and stuff like that. But he's also written a lot of graphic novels. He has a, a two volume set called Boxers and Saints. That is a graphic novel about the um, Boxer Rebellion and uh, a lot of sort of interesting kind of Chinese history with the with the Catholic experience there stuff. Really great, really accessible. Uh, so if you're looking for a super good resource on that kind of thing that, that a kid would actually pick up and engage with and not fall asleep to, Jean Luen Yang. I want to thank our presenters, Father Jonathan. Uh, thank you. For your virtual presence, uh, Father Ojun Chen, and Dr. Negan. And I want to thank all of you who joined us. Thank you.